Okay, I want to do a message here on uh, some key scriptures that every Christian should know. A while back, I was contacted by someone who had recently been saved, and they said, are there some scriptures that I should memorize so that I can use them in life that would help me through my life now as a new Christian? And, um, of course, I answered the email and everything. I sent some to them, but... Uh, it kind of set me to thinking, and I thought, you know, I really need to have a message on this. It's going to be important for me to have this down as a sermon. So I just wanted to do a quick study here uh, this evening. It's uh, September the 29th of 2010 when I'm recording this. And um, I have everything typed out here, so I'm not going to give you any time to be turning to the scriptures. I'm really going to go through this quick. I am going to make it available as a PDF if you want to... Uh, download it and print them out that way. It's about six pages in length uh, with the scriptures typed out. But uh, after this uh, new Christian had contacted me, I decided to make a video for YouTube where I actually discussed 12 key verses. And I said, you know, I have some that I think are key to being very important for a Christian, but I'd like to hear from you people out there on YouTube, you know, all the different people who subscribe to my channel or who would watch the video. And I got a lot of replies, a whole lot of replies. And so my 12 key scriptures uh, has grown to a lot more than 12. And uh, we're going to go through those here in this study. I'm going to go through them as quickly as possible. But there are these are some very important verses which I think are key to your life as a Christian understanding these things. I want to start out first in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Uh, it says here, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, you see there in verse 16 that the purpose of scripture is fourfold. Okay, number one, you have doctrine for reproof. Number two, for number three, correction. Number four, instruction in righteousness. Now, that's the one that I want to talk about in this study. The verses that I'm going to, going to give you, they're not going to be a big doctrinal thing here and, and everything. It's going to be for instruction in righteousness. If you can get these verses memorized and get them figured out, it'll save you a lot of grief in this life. Okay, but I just want to say this, as far as doctrine is concerned, you need to be very careful when you go through the Bible and you just pick one or two verses out to prove doctrine. Okay, doctrine is a, is a much deeper study than is instruction in righteousness. Okay, both doctrine and instruction in righteousness, you can go pretty much anywhere in the Bible. But with doctrine, you have to be very, very careful. Okay, you have to rightly divide the word of God dispensationally. You have to realize that things that were written in the Old Testament are not for you today. Many things that were written back there, as in the sacrificing of animals, all the Levitical law for the Jewish people, you can't make those apply to today as your life as a Christian. Your doctrine as a Christian will be found primarily in the Pauline epistles. Okay? And that's where you're going to want to look for your doctrine. Now, there will be other passages in the four Gospels, in uh, the whole way from Hebrews, the whole way to Revelation. You'll see verses in there that are doctrinal for the church age. Okay? So, but you, you, you just need to be careful. This I'm not trying to promote, in other words, I'm not trying to promote taking one or two verses and basing all your doctrine on one or two verses, all right? I am talking tonight about instruction in righteousness. Now, that's important to remember that as we go through this study. So, having given that as a little bit of an introduction, let's continue through here. I'm going to go down through my list of important verses that a Christian should know and understand, and it will save you a lot of trouble in this life. Verse number one would be 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. 
which is, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Understand that the base for all evil is the love of money. You say, well, now I don't agree with that because what about uh, rape? Well, how did the rapist get to that point where he becomes that perverted that he goes out and rapes a woman? How did he get there? Well, I can guarantee you it was because he got messed up on pornography. And what's the reason for pornography? Well, it's a big money-making scam. It's up into the billions of dollars a year here in America. It's a huge money-making scheme. Okay? So you see, love of money is the root of all evil. Okay? And, and you can get down through the list. We're not going to cover a lot of detail. But if you can get that thing figured out, if you want to see where the center for evil is, it will always be centered around people trying to make a lot of money. What's the purpose in the drug trade? Lots of money. Uh, what's the purpose in wars? A lot of money. Uh, I did a message not too long ago about the military-industrial complex. Uh, the, the reason that we have wars is to make people rich. Okay, you need to get that stuff figured out. So... Number one, you have 1 Timothy 6.10. Understand that the love of money is the root of all evil. Number two, number two key scripture that you should memorize is 1 Thessalonians 2.13, which says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, you need to understand from that verse that God will not bless you in the reading of his word, and he will not enable you to understand his word until you begin to believe what you are reading. If you approach the King James Bible with a critical spirit and say, I think that this, this is a poor translation, God will never reveal anything to you other than what you, you know, you'll just parrot what you've been taught in your church or your seminary. God will never speak to you if you come with an unbelieving spirit. Okay, You need to approach the Word of God, the King James Bible. You need to approach it believing that it is God's perfect Word. Okay, That's also very important. Number three, the third key scripture. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, which says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, how many Christians are guilty of not understanding that? They totally forget themselves and they, they don't realize the Bible says that Satan is the god of this world. Second Corinthians 4.4 4, it says, In whom the god of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Satan is the god of this world. He is the enemy, not a Democrat, not a Republican, not the Council on Foreign Relations or the Illuminati or the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds or all this stuff. They're people. They all need to be saved just like anybody else. Now, will they be? No, probably not. Okay? But the point is, they're people. They're flesh and blood. Our battle is spiritual. Okay? Okay? The, if if you would take out every member of the Illuminati and all the New World Order people and everything, Satan would go and he would find a whole group of new people to take their place. Within 24 hours, you'd have the same problem. Why? Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Keep that in mind. Okay, the fourth key scripture, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, there's a few things you need to understand from that passage. Okay, first of all, this is church-age doctrine. Okay, it does not apply in the future after the body of Christ leaves. I just wanted to say that there. But salvation right now is based on faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the blood that he shed. It is a gift of God. Our salvation is what God has done, not what we are doing. It is not of works. Now, 
the majority of cults, the vast majority of cults, are about works, good works. You know why? Because if you are working your way to heaven, then you can be controlled. They can control you. They can tell you, well, you know, I don't know if you're going to heaven for sure. You're going to have to do more good works. It's also a good way for you to, for somebody, for a false prophet to get your money. Okay? So get that thing straightened out in your mind, too. Uh, key scripture number five, 2 Timothy 2.15. I referred to this earlier. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, it's a command for you to study the word of God. And how do you do it? By rightly dividing the word of truth. Obviously, you're never going to go to church carrying a little cage with turtle doves in it and say, well, you know, it's my sin offering. Uh, no, that doesn't apply to today. Why? Well, because we're in a different dispensation. All right? And there's a lot more. Listen to some of the, the message on... Uh, Non-dispensational Christian contradictions. Okay, if you want more information on that. Okay, now number six. Number this number six key scripture. It says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, that one is one of the more important ones. If you can get that thing figured out, you will not be deceived as quickly by some of these people out there. Okay? You see some leader, quote-unquote leader, in Christianity, how are they accepted or rejected by the world? Well, you have a man like Billy Graham who's loved by the world. And then you find out that Billy Graham has turned his back on Christians in Russia and China and actually had house church Christians arrested in those countries. And he's just, Billy Graham is a very wicked man. Okay, and do some study on it. He says, he has publicly stated on Robert Schuller's program that there are many paths to heaven, including Muslims and Catholics. Okay, Billy Graham's not a good man. He's a false prophet and all you need to know is James 4.4, 4, and you look at him and you say, wait a second, this guy's getting network television specials, and they all respect him. He's not the friend of God. He's the enemy of God. It says there, a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I'll give you one more example. Amy Grant, another one. She sings national anthems at big sporting events. They give her her own TV show. The world loves her. Well, if you read search her life, you'll see that she was raised in the Church of Christ, which they do not teach biblical salvation. They teach baptism as a means of salvation. Uh, baptism comes after salvation, and it's, it's an ordinance, and uh, it's not the plan of salvation. But then she, also, she went from the Church of Christ to a radical, charismatic group, which was known for fornication and drugs. <laughs> okay, that's her history as a quote-unquote Christian. Okay, and, and there's a lot more I could say about her. But again, she's a friend of the world. And the friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4.4. 4. Remember that one. Key scripture number 7. 1 John 5.13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Two of the men from our ministry here were recently at a fair, and they... We're talking to an old order Mennonite couple, and the old order Mennonite couple, the woman said, you cannot know whether or not you're saved until after you're dead. Well, that is heresy, okay? And 1 John 5.13 is all you need to know to disprove that, okay? God has written unto you the record of his son, the King James Bible, you can hold it in your hands and you can know, based on the, the Word of God, the written Word of God, the written record, you can know that you're going to heaven when you die. Okay, don't let people talk you out of that. Key scripture number 8, 2 Timothy 3.13 But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Okay, now the evolution theory, 
teaches that things get better and better, and we're getting better and better, and everything's going up. The Bible teaches there in 2 Timothy 3.13 that everything's going down. It's the opposite direction. It gets worse and worse. And the only way that things are brought back is through Jesus Christ. Not through man, not through all the people coming together and making a utopia here on the earth. That's nonsense. Things are getting worse and worse. And you can see it. It's proven. Things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. More and more people are losing their jobs. The economy is going down. Disease, pestilence, war, it's all getting worse. And it's only going to keep getting worse. All right? Again, don't be deceived by people telling you that good times are just around the corner and that man is bringing it in. That is a lie. Uh, key scripture number 9, Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? As a Christian, you need to be a non-conformist. Okay, there was, there's actually been groups of people that have been like that. That doesn't mean that you have to do some kind of physical thing and really make a show and, and act strange or something like that. No. What it means is you cannot be concerned with the styles and with what is popular in this world. Okay? Don't waste your time on that. And if you do, if you are concerned with looking stylish and hip and being accepted by the world and looking like the world, and talking like the world, and laughing with the world, if you do those things, the Bible says right there, you will not prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It won't happen. God will not deal with a Christian who is worldly. Period. You say, well, is there an exception? No, absolutely not. Uh, key scripture number 10, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God... And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, our pastor, uh, Pastor Jesse Dulesky, he just did a message here uh, this past Sunday on bishops and deacons. There, are, There is an office there, okay? But all they are supposed to do is be there to make sure everything runs smoothly, to take the oversight, and to teach. But a bishop and a deacon, anybody in church ministry, should always point a Christian to Jesus Christ as the solution for all of your problems. If I start saying, you need to come to me, you need to confess your sins to me, you need to, you know, pray to me, that would be, that would be proof that I'd be a false prophet, okay? Jesus Christ is the one mediator between God and man. You don't need anybody else. In the long run, you don't need anyone but Jesus Christ. Okay? Always keep that in mind. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 is the next key scripture. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay? The Bible says in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38, The just shall live by faith. If you are saved... You are going to have to live by faith. And if you say, well, I, God's going to have to show me proof of everything before I can believe it, you're never going to amount to anything as a Christian. You have to live by faith. Okay? Hebrews 11, verse 6, by the way, um, this isn't the next key scripture, but this is another important one. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Remember that. You have to live by faith. There's plenty of proof. There's lots of research and everything to prove that Christianity is the one true religion, the one true faith. But at the end of the day, you are not going to be able to answer everybody's questions, everybody's attacks. You will have to live by faith. Okay? That's just the way it is. Uh, key scripture number 12. 1 Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. All acceptation. That means everybody. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Okay? Now, the number one group of people that are headed for hell will always be self-righteous people. 
That's the reason the majority go to hell. Are you a bad person? Are you a sinner? Oh, I'm not so bad. I've never killed anybody. I, you know, That's what they'll say. You need to remember and keep it in mind that you are always going to be a sinner. Now, try to sin as little as you have to because you're going to have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ, but you will always be a sinner. That's why you got saved. That's why you needed to be saved. Okay? Paul. Do you think you're on Paul's level? And yet Paul says, of whom I am chief. Now, if Paul could admit to being the chiefest of sinners, what should we be admit, admitting to? Something, something there to think about. Number 13, uh, Psalm 119, verse 11. That's the next key scripture. It says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Now, there have been many songs written with that as part of the lyrics. And I remember singing that in Sunday school as a little boy. And it's it's very basic, but yet it's very profound. Okay? How do you keep from sinning? It's God's word that keeps you from sin. Uh, there's an old saying, either God's word will keep me from sin, or my sin will keep me from God's word. There's a lot of truth in that. Okay, the best way to fight sin is by memorizing scripture. It says there another part, uh, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto or thereunto according to thy word. Okay, uh, the next key scripture, number 14 here is Psalm 138, verse 2. It says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word lowercase w, above all thy name. Now that is also very important to remember. The most important physical possession that you own on this earth is the Word of God, the King James Bible. If you use anything but a King James Bible, please get in contact with me and ask me why I'm King James only. I will explain it. Or you can go to kingjamesvideoministries.com. We have just almost a hundred videos now available for free that you can watch. Okay. The King James Bible is the single most precious book on this planet. The single most precious physical thing. Some people say, I've heard Christians say, well, it's not a big issue. It's not something I'd fight over. Well, you need to check your relationship with the Lord. Okay. Because he says here in Psalm 138 verse 2 that he has magnified his word above his name. Okay, you hear somebody saying, oh my, and then they use God's name in vain, and it, it makes your skin crawl. Well, it should make your skin crawl even more when you hear somebody say, the King James Bible's not that big of an issue to me. Okay, they're taking God's word in vain at that point. Very serious. Uh, key scripture number 15, 1 Peter one twenty three. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word, again, lowercase w, it's written word, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God promised to preserve his word. And people say, well, that, that had to refer to the uh, original autographs. Oh, really? Where are the original autographs at? They're gone. They don't exist. Nobody even knows what they said. Okay? But... We have had faithful copies made of those Greek texts, of the Hebrew texts in the Old Testament, and they come to you today as an English translation. The greatest Bible that ever showed up on the planet is the King James Bible. Okay? We have the Word of God today, and it lives and abides forever. Okay, this is a living book. There was a man who once said, that the Bible, the King James Bible, is the only book that has the author present every time you read it. Just amazing. Key scripture number 16. 1 John 2.15. This one kind of goes in with James 4.4. 4. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, does that mean that you can't love a good pizza? Or uh, you can't love flowers or something like that. No, it doesn't mean that. It just simply means that you can't love it more than the Lord. Okay, and, and many times when you read about the world, it's the course of the world. 
the popular things, the popular music, the styles, the whatever. You're not to love that. You're to stay away from it, run from it. Okay, and I'm going to show you a verse here next, the next key scripture that really kind of drives this thing home. Number 17 is 1 Thessalonians 5.22. It's a very short one, and this is an important one to, to have memorized. It says, abstain from all appearance of evil. In other words, you're not only supposed to stay away from evil, but even the appearance of evil. Okay? And that's why a Christian should stay away from the filthy, wicked magazines, television shows, and movies. You say, well, they're just pretend. It's just pretend. But it's the appearance of evil. And let me tell you something. There are many times that you will watch something filthy, and that thing will still be in your mind Ten years down the road, you'll still remember that filthy thing that you watched. And, and dear Christian out there, I want to warn you specifically about pornography. Okay? As a younger man, I looked at the stuff. I looked at dirty magazines and, you know, I'd be with friends and, hey, look at this. Oh, boy. I can still see that garbage in my mind. It doesn't go away. I wish I would have abstained from all appearance of evil. Okay, I'm clean from it now, praise the Lord, but I'll tell you what, that stuff stays with you. And I used to listen to a lot of secular heavy metal, and I can tell you the lyrics to most of those songs. And back then I said, I, you know, I, I don't listen to the lyrics, I only, li I only like it for the music. Yeah, it's a lie. Okay, the lyrics were going into my head, and television, magazines, movies, they're even worse. Because it's not only words, it's not only music but it's also images. And the Bible tells you, abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay? Another thing that's very important. Okay, moving on to the next one. Key verse, key scripture, number 18, is Matthew chapter 10, verse 36. Now, I'm going to read verses 34 through 37 to get in context here. But it says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword... For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Here's verse 36. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The fact of the matter is, friend, if you decide to obey the truth and submit to the truth no matter what it costs you will have family members and friends turn against you it's absolutely 100 percent guaranteed i guarantee it i don't know one single bible believer and i've talked to many many people just probably hundreds of them now all over the world all different countries all different nationalities and i have never met one that gets along 100% with all their family. I've never met one. I've met people that their friends don't talk to them, their family doesn't, doesn't talk to them, they think they're in a cult, they're, they're, you know, they make fun of them. I go through it myself. I have members of my own family that think I'm crazy, you know, that mock me. Okay? It just goes along with the territory. Jesus Christ was not accepted among his own brethren, his own people. What makes you think that you're going to do any better than Jesus did? Okay, number 19. Key scripture number number 19 here. Mark 8, verse 36. And again, I'm going to read 35 through 38 to get into the context. Verse 35 says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now verse 36 there is what we want to focus on. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Don't envy the celebrities and the multimillionaires. They've gained the whole world. There are a lot of people out there that can have anything that they want. But guess what? They're going to go to hell for all of eternity. 
Now, there is not enough money in this world. There's not enough riches. There's not enough, you know, pretty women, fancy cars, fast motorcycles, whatever. There's not enough of that out there to, to bribe me to give up my salvation, which I can't give up. But the point is to keep me from getting saved. You would be a fool, an absolute fool, to reject Jesus Christ so that you could have this world. That's foolish. Okay. Uh, next one that we want to cover here, next key scripture, number 20, is John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, the one thing that this world hates with a passion, they hate the thought of a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, saying, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. And they'll often say that. Oh, do you think that you're right and everybody else is wrong? Absolutely. Sure. Jesus Christ is the only way into heaven. All the other systems, all other religious systems are false. Every single one of them. There's no other way to heaven. Okay, Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And his name is Jesus, okay? It's not that people are trying to get away from Jesus. They're, they're saying Yua, Yeshua, excuse me. They're saying Yeshua, the Messiah, and all this stuff. It's Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the name, okay? If you want to upset people, go into a crowd and say, uh, I'm here to testify for Yeshua. Most of the people look at you kind of like, huh? But you go in and say, I'd like to talk to you today about the Lord Jesus Christ. You will see people looking at the ground and they'll, they'll try to get out of there. Be like setting a bomb off. Okay. And, and of course, I mean, spiritually there. I'm not, I'm not advocating violence. Okay. Key scripture number 21. 1 Corinthians 2.15. And here's another one that the world hates. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. The fact is, as a Christian, you have a perfect standard in the King James Bible, and you have a right and a responsibility even to judge things. Spiritual judgment now, by the way. Don't judge somebody based on the outward appearance. The Bible does warn about that. Don't judge somebody because you don't like them. Okay, but if you see somebody who's a sodomite, you have a right to say, hey, the Bible says man shall not lay with mankind. It is abomination. And they say, yeah, but I don't agree with that. It doesn't matter. The Bible says it. It's truth. You have a right to judge people. Okay, they say you're being judgmental. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes. Okay, key scripture number 22. This is another good one. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You want to be wise? You want to be educated? Okay, start out by fearing God. You say, well, then I, I should be walking around like cowering and, and thinking that the sky is falling, God's going to kill me? No, that's not what it means. The fear of the Lord there is saying, I'm not going to laugh at that dirty joke. And they're going to make fun of me, but that's okay because I fear God more than I fear these people. See, it goes along with not conforming to the world, not being loved by the world. You see, if you fear man, you'll conform to the world. If you fear God, you won't conform to the world. Just as simple as that. A key, key scripture, number 23. 1 Timothy 6, 20. And I'm going to read verse 21 as well. Uh, o Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Okay. But verse 20 there is the one that we want to focus on. Oppositions of science, falsely so called. Much of what is called, quote unquote, science today is actually a way for the lost to discredit the Bible. You say, give me some examples. Okay, evolution, climate change. <laughs> Both of those systems of belief are not based on true science. Evolution especially. 
The origin of species is a, is a fairy tale. It's absolutely absurd. But why did they do it? Why did they create this origin of species? Why did Darwin go against the Bible? Well, because Darwin was a sinner, a wicked sinner, and he hated the idea of a powerful, perfect, almighty God that would judge him one day. And that's why people go with the evolution theory. Okay, now some people go through school, they come out believing it, not really knowing why. There are some people that are like that. But your atheists who cling to evolution and they defend it to the death, it's because they can't stand the thought of God judging them one day. And God judging the earth also, and you read the book of Revelation, God's going to be judging the earth with plagues, with bad weather, with all kinds of things coming up. Now, the sinful, lost world, they see it and they say, I don't want to, we got to cover up this thing of God's wrath being poured out. And boy, I'll tell you what, read the book of Revelation and you can see it. You can see how people, they don't repent. There's earthquakes, there's hailstones falling from heaven. All these natural disasters that God is causing to punish the wicked world and they don't repent. They don't turn to God. They don't turn from their wickedness. Okay, so watch out for oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Science is testable, it's observable, it's demonstrable. That's science. We don't, as Christians, we don't have to shun anything under the, under the umbrella of what is called science. But we do have to be careful if somebody comes along and says, well, I, science has proved the Bible wrong, and they're talking about evolution or climate change or some of this other phony science, don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. Okay, the next key scripture is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Okay, Jesus Christ is to be the source of your strength. You know, you get into bodybuilding or something and say, ah, I can do it now because I'm, a, you know, 250 pounds and six foot four or something like that. No, that's wrong. I have seen instances of people that are small that have more courage and more guts when it comes to handing out tracks than I do. And I am about six foot four and around 200 pounds. So it has nothing to do with it. Okay. If the Lord wants you to do something, the Bible says there in Philippians 4.13 that you can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Keep that in mind. If the Lord has a work for you to do and you know that he wants you to do that, you can do it through the power of Jesus Christ. Uh, also very important and very convicting, I might add. Uh, key verse number 25, Romans 8.28 it says here, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. If you are in the will of God and you love the Lord and you love his word and you're doing his work, whatever happens to you, it will work together for good. Okay, it might not seem good when it happens. I know I've had situations in my past that, I, that at the time it was horrible. It was bad, but I realized later on, years later, that it was working together for good. I'm in ministry right now because the Lord didn't answer all, all the prayers of my past. Okay, But now it says there, all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, if you are being disobe disobedient and the Lord punishes you, he corrects you, he chastens you, that's not the same thing, okay? It's not working together. Well, it is working together for good still because punishment is good. That shows the Lord loves you and he's concerned for you. But if you are doing things according to the flesh, the Bible says if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. Okay, that's both for the saved and for the lost. If you mess around with the flesh, you mess around with pornography or cigarettes or alcohol or drugs or whatever, you will die. Okay, and that's not going to work together for good. All right, you're failing the Lord. The verse Romans eight twenty eight is for those who are serving the Lord and living right. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Just a few more here, and then we're done. Uh, number twenty six, Colossians two eight. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit 
after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. I knew a young lady the one time, and very pretty young lady. Uh, I knew her ever since she was just a little girl. They were friends of the family. And uh, she started going off to some university somewhere. And they were over the one time, and I said, Oh, what are you taking in your school? And she said, I'm taking philosophy. And I remember thinking to myself, Well, she's doomed. That's it. It's over. Spiritually, she's going to be destroyed. And I was right. Why? Because they will spoil you. The Bible warns about being spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit. Again, oppositions of science falsely so-called. You go out into the universities to get a, quote, education, and you will oftentimes be destroyed as a Christian as a result. The, the statistic I heard, and it's probably higher now, but 75% of Christians that went off to secular, secular universities denied their faith after one year of college, secular college. Okay, and the Bible colleges, quote unquote, too, are busy with Alexandrian philosophy to destroy young men's faith in the Word of God. They go in, believe in the King James Bible, they come out denying it. They come out with Alexandrian philosophy. Again, philosophy spoils. Okay, it destroys people. All right, and after the tradition of men, you have to watch out for churches that hold tradition above the word of God. That's what the Pharisees did. That's why Jesus attacked the Pharisees. Also, again, very important to remember that. Okay, key scripture number 27. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, when you fall for something, when you look at something dirty on the internet, some kind of pornographic thing, or when you smoke a cigarette, or when you drink something or whatever, you need to understand, you say, oh, where, where was God at? Where was God? Why did he allow that to happen? Why did he, why did he allow that to me to do that sin? Well, if you would have searched, you would have found that there was a way out of that. Did you really need to turn on the computer? Did you really need to go to that person's house that you know had a drinking problem? Did you really need to go outside the restaurant to see where the people were there, walk out among them that are smoking a cigarette, knowing that you have a problem with that? See, God makes a way out of the temptation. And if you fall for the temptation, it's not God's fault. It's your fault. Okay? There are ways out of temptations that you don't have to sin. Okay, number 28, key verse, key scripture, number 28, Proverbs 16, 18. It says here, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Okay, humble yourself. Don't get too big. If, if you get into ministry and God starts doing things through you, stay humble. Do not get proud. Do not let people start bowing down before you, okay? That's a bad, bad thing. Why? Because when you start to get proud, you start to forget the Lord, and the Lord will say, okay, I'm going to let you fall flat on your face. It's kind of like, you know, our pastor here at Bible Believers Fellowship, They, him and his wife have a little boy, and a lot of times, you know, he's just learning to walk, and a lot of times you can grab his hands and you can help him walk. And he'll he'll walk along giggling and stuff. He thinks that's great. But guess what happens when you let go of his hands? He falls. Well, that is a picture of us as Christians and our walk with the Lord. We can't walk on our own. We don't have our own strength. Okay? But the Lord will take our hands and he will lead us. He will lead us along. He will direct our paths. Okay, as the Bible says back in Proverbs. But guess what happens when we get proud and we start getting puffed up? God, God will let go of your hands and say, okay, you try walking a little bit on your own. And that's when you fall flat on your face. Stay humble. Say, God, don't let go of my hands. I need your help. Don't get to a point where you think that you're so good and so holy that you don't need the help of the Lord. Because that will never happen. Okay, two more. 
key scripture number 29, Ephesians 1, 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now I have a whole message on eternal security, and there's a lot more scripture there, but this is an important one, Ephesians 1, 13, to realize you heard the word of truth first, then you believed it, and after that, after you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, after that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You cannot lose your salvation in this present dispensation in the church age. Anybody who teaches that you can lose your salvation, they will need to leave the Pauline epistles to prove it. Every single one of them. Or twist scriptures within the Pauline epistles. Okay, And why do they do it? Because if I can get you to doubt your salvation, then I can control you. The Catholics do it. The Mennonites do it. A lot of different people out there will get you to doubt your salvation so that they can control you. The Pentecostals will also do it. And they can get more money. They can extort more money out of the people. Okay, finally, the last one. And this is these are my two favorite verses of Scripture in the entire Bible. Okay, these are kind of, if, if I had to pick life verses, these are the two. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. It says here, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. There's a little song that they sing in Sunday schools, I'm in the Lord's army. You know, and you are. If you are a Christian, you are called to be a soldier. You say, well, I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense. Well, let me explain it to you. Here are some similarities between actual soldiers and Christians. Number one, a soldier must be trained before he goes into combat. Okay, every soldier has to go through basic training. They have to be instructed. They have to have a drill instructor that teaches them how to survive, how to shoot, how to fight, how to do everything so that they survive the combat. And unfortunately, in Christianity, there are a lot of soldiers that don't have the proper training. And I'm not talking about seminary. I'm not talking about PhDs and THDs. That stuff's not even scriptural. What I'm talking about is there are a lot of young men that get all puffed up and they go off and they become bishops, they become pastors, and they are novices. Okay, I personally believe that a young man ought to wait till he's about 30 years old before he gets into ministry. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't start his earthly ministry till he was 30 years old. Why would you do it any differently than that? Why do you think you're more qualified than the Lord Jesus Christ and God manifest in the flesh? I think the Lord did that as an example that we should follow. Now, in some rare cases, maybe, you know, you got some guy in his mid to late 20s who's really done a lot of research, done a lot of study for the Lord. But part of it is you need more than head knowledge. You need life application. You need to study. You need to learn things. You need to go through some experiences for the Lord. And if you don't, you get out into ministry as a young man, a young whippersnapper, as they say, in his early 20s or something, or even late teens. I've heard of preachers in their teens. There's no such thing as a godly teenage preacher, okay? And what, what happens is they get out there into the battlefield, and they're not trained specifically for all the different aspects that you need to know when you get into ministry. And as a result, they get killed on the battlefield. And they fall into heresy because they did not take the time to study. Because, see, when you get into ministry, you are not going to have time to sit down and read books and books and watch videos and listen to audio tapes and good preaching. When you get into ministry, you get very, very busy. Okay? Number two, a soldier that's going to war expects that they will be shot at. Okay, if you're a soldier and they give you a call and they say, we're going to be shipping you to Afghanistan, you're not going to say, oh, this is going to be great. This will be wonderful. What a fun time I have ahead of me. No, you're going to go over there and you're going to expect that the enemy is going to be shooting at you. 
Now, as a Christian, when you get saved and you want to learn the truth and you want to stand for the truth, expect to be shot at by the lost world. And I mean spiritually, but even sometimes physically. Uh, Christians have been shot for their witness, for their stand. But what I'm talking mostly about is spiritual. You will be attacked in the workplace. You will be attacked in public. You will be attacked in your own home. Okay, You will be attacked as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Number three, a soldier knows that they will have to go through rough times. Okay, Endure hardness. It says there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. You are to endure hardness. Your world, your treasures that you have are not here on this earth. They're up in heaven. Okay. Um, number four, a soldier fights. If you are a Christian, God's called you to fight for his word. He's called you to earnestly contend for the faith. Number five, a soldier knows the value of a good weapon. A soldier does not want to go into battle with an unproven rifle. Okay, You get to know your rifle. You get to know your weapon that you carry into battle. And likewise, in like manner, you better know your King James Bible before you go into battle. And you better have that thing. You better keep it nice and sharp by reading it every day. And you can study about the other pieces of the armor, Christian armor, there in Ephesians chapter 6. But your sword is your offensive weapon. And you got to keep that thing in good condition. Okay? Uh, number six. A soldier who joins the enemy is a traitor. Okay? And there are a lot of professing Christians out there that have gone over to the enemy's side. They look like the world. They act like the world. They laugh at the world's jokes. They forsake the King James Bible. They forsake the hymns that bring glory to the Lord the old-fashioned hymns, they are traitors to the cause. As a soldier, you are to stand for the truth. Having done all to stand, it says about there in Ephesians chapter 6. Okay, I, I kind of went to the next point. Uh, point number seven, a soldier must stand their ground. Okay, you are to stand your ground. Uh, over and over and over again, stand fast. You are to stand, 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 stand. Don't back down. Okay? Um, number eight, a soldier must be vigilant. First Peter 5, 8 talks about the devil walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Um, and it says, be sober, be vigilant. If you're going out into battle, you don't want to be drunk. You want to be sober. You want to be vigilant. Okay? And it's interesting because I actually heard from a, a real soldier the one time was in Vietnam, and he said the best time to attack the enemy was in the morning and in the evening. Because in the morning, they're just waking up. In the evening, they're getting tired. They're not vigilant. See? They're not really at their full alert status. Okay? And as a Christian, there are times when you will get lazy and you'll get away from the Word of God and whatever, and you'll start, you know, getting a little bit carnal, that's when the devil's going to attack you. Okay? You need to be vigilant. You have to watch out. Be sober. Be vigilant. Number nine, a soldier considers it an honor to die on the battlefield. Oh, come on. That's a horrible one. Yeah, but I'll tell you what. When you get into the process of sanctification, where you start to give up things for the Lord, where you start to say, okay, Lord, I want to spend my time serving you, it will come up at some point in time, I believe the Lord will say to you, will you die for me? Would you die in my cause, fighting in my cause? You know, you read the book of Acts where Peter is, and you know, a couple of the other guys, they're beaten for the Lord and they go out and they rejoice. Can you say that you're at that point? I have to ask myself that question. Can I say that I'm at that point? That's tough to get to that point in your mind. Okay? But when you realize what the battle's all about, you realize, hey, you know, Paul talked about, I will gladly spend and be spent, you know, essentially for this cause. Will you be spent for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the call of a true soldier. 
Okay? Number 10, a soldier fights for the love of God and country. Now, we are in a war down here. There are a lot of things that we can fight. We can fight against the new versions. We can fight against rock and roll music. We can fight against Roman Catholicism, against Islam, against Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses. On and on and on. There are many battlefields that you can fight, that you can spend and be spent in. The fight. Okay? But we're to do it for the love of God. And the country that we're fighting for is not America. It's not the UK. It's not Australia. It's not Germany. It's not... Uh, I have a brother over there in the Faroe Islands. Many people don't even know where that is. That's not it. The country that we are fighting for is New Jerusalem. That's the city that we will be in eternally. Okay. Uh, number 11. Two more and then we're done. A soldier takes orders and obeys the orders. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are to take orders from the word of God. We've gone over a couple of them. Love not the world. Study to show thyself approved. Those are orders. Are you obeying them? Be not conformed to this world. There's another order. Are you obeying? If the Lord tells you to do something, do you obey? You know, there's a thing in the military they say, yes, sir, no, you have, excuse me. There's a thing in the military where they say you have three answers that you can give a commanding officer. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. Is that the way you live as a Christian? It's a challenge. And number 12, about a soldier, how they're compared to a Christian. Number 12 is, a soldier keeps fighting even when he is surrounded and outnumbered. Right now, we are encircled by the enemy. <laughs> okay, we are outnumbered. Uh, there's another military term called a rear guard action. That's where you realize the enemy is taking over and all you're trying to do is stall the enemy. Okay, that's where we're at right now. Christians in the 21st century, 21st century, uh, September the 29th, 2010, as I'm doing this recording, we are outnumbered. We are surrounded. Okay, they are breaking through the defenses. Right now, they're trying to pass hate crime legislation, trying to destroy our First Amendment rights here in America, the First Amendment rights that were set up by Bible-believing Christians to protect Christianity to keep us out of the prisons, to keep us from being burned at the stake. And they're breaking through those defenses. Okay? We're to hold the fort. We're to stand our ground. Earnestly contend for the faith. Okay? You are called to be a soldier. You are in a battle, whether you like it or not. So, that's going to be it for this study. Uh, I just wanted to put that thing together because there are some important scriptures that you need to know for instruction and in righteousness. Get these verses, memorize them, know how to turn to them. A lot of times in my messages, you're going to hear me quoting these scriptures because they're foundational to the way we as Christians are supposed to live. They are foundational to our relationship to the world, to our relationship to the Lord, even. So those are important scriptures to know. Spend time in God's Word. That's the most important thing, the most important physical possession you have on this planet is the King James Bible for the English-speaking world.